Welcome back. And now we're going to talk about chapter 16 of negotiations. So I'm going to share my monitor. And um, let's put this bad boy on. Um, let's, let's put it on the uh, screen and share chapter 16. Wow, we got a lot going on here. I'll start with the sliding slideshow. Let's go. Um, so international and cross-cultural negotiations is what we're talking about today. Um, international negotiations, art, and science. The science provides research evidence supporting, um, really supporting trends occurring during the negotiation process. Now, the art. The art is deciding which strategy, models, and perspectives increase cross-cultural understanding. And then there's complexity of international negotiation, which has two impl 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 implications, excuse me. First, there are many models and perspectives, not one size fits all. We've heard that before, right? No, not one size fits anything at all. And second, negotiators undervalue the um, undervalue the within culture variation that exists in uh, various cultures. Uh, guards against the cultural attribution era, the tendency to overlook situational factors in favor of cultural explanations. And so that can be a determining factor. So what makes these international negotiations different? Well, two overall contexts influence international negotiations. The first is the environmental context includes environmental forces that neither negotiator controls, but that, the, that influence the negotiations. So let's get that straight, the environment. The environment can control the negotiator, but doesn't influence the negotiations, okay? And then the immediate context, which includes factors over which negotiators appear to have some control. So they may understand, you know, what's in front of them. They have some control, like buying a house, um, the example we use in the previous uh, chapter that we discussed, um, in buying a house, uh, there could be some immediate control, but the environment itself uh, could have uh, factors that ne the negotiator uh, doesn't control environment, meaning when the closing happens, the attorneys, everybody's involved, the closing agents and all of that. And so understanding the role of both contexts is important to understand the complexity of international negotiations. So let's talk a little bit about the environmental context. So we have political and legal pluralism, and these are taxes, labor codes, contract law, NAFTA, WTO, the World, um, uh, WTO organizations, international economies, uh, which are less uh, stable currencies, increases the risk of the parties, or there could be foreign governments, which do they regulate these industries that you're negotiating within, and stability. Can uh, there be a resource or political instability associated there? And then we have ideology. And the, the US uh, believes in the individual rights. Other countries may not believe in individual rights. Depends on what side of the country, which country you're working with as to what they believe in. If you're working with a country like Russia or uh, one of the communist countries, they might not believe in individual rights. And then you have culture the process and conflict resolutions that vary between, there are these things vary between the various cultures. Um, and so you wanna be, um, there's, a, if you haven't, I don't know if you, you may have had this class where you talked about culture and your undergraduate at Hofstede's uh, cultural variances and how the various cultures of different countries work. Uh, if you have it, you may wanna look up Hofstede. Um, external stakeholders, uh, people and organizations with an interest or stake in that outcome, as well as business association, labor unions, or embassies. And so there's the immediate context that could involve uh, uh, be involved in the negotiations of process as well. And this includes uh, relatives bargaining power, um, 
some examples of this is research is on joint ventures or whoever invests more has more relative power or influence over that particular negotiations. And then levels of conflict. So high conflict situations will be difficult to resolve versus diplomatic or back channel negotiations uh, that may help out a little bit. And then you have the negotiator's relationships. Uh, this negotiation is part of a past or future relationship. So when people have worked together, there's a little bit more bargaining power in all of that um, that's involved there. And then there's desired outcomes, tangible versus intangible factors, uh, immediate uh, stakeholders. And these are the negotiators and those they directly represent. Uh, negotiator CQ impacts process and outcomes. So now let's talk a little bit about conceptualizing culture and negotiations. So all definitions of culture share two important aspects. The first is culture is a group level phenomenon. And second is cultural beliefs, values and behavior expectations are learned and passed on to new members of the group. Now you can conceptualize culture four ways uh, in international negotiation, and those four ways are as learned behavior, as shared value, as a dialectic, and as in context. So culture as a learned behavior, let's look at that. This approach does not focus on why members of a given culture behave in a certain way. Um, it concentrates on creating a catalog, really, of behaviors um, that the foreign negotiator should expect when entering into a host culture. Now, many books and articles proved a list of do's and don'ts uh, to obey when negotiating with people from different cultures. Culture as a shared values, here's Hofstede model of uh, cultural dimensions, individualism versus collectivism, uh, the focus on the relationships in its collectiveness, societies critical in negotiations and power and distance, how power, uh, high power distance cultures concentrate uh, decision making at the top while low power distance cultures spread decision making throughout the group. Uh, masculinity versus femininity. And Hofstede states, states that masculine cultures are more materialistic, where feminine cultures are more nurturing. And these are the same things we say about um, the sexes in various groups. And even though Hofstede is talking to us about models of culture of, from international, we could take a lot of this and apply it in to um, culture as we're dealing with dynamics between uh, male, female, races, and all of that within a one culture, one society like area, well, in the USA, for example, or Canada, and so on and so forth. So uncertainty avoidance is a high uncertainty avoidance cultures are less comfortable with ambiguity. Now, culture as shared values. Um, Edwin Hall specified that cultural values used to understand differences in cultures to uh, apply to international negotiation. Um, communication contacts, low context cultures communicate directly while high context cultures communicate indirectly. Time and space um, refers to differences between cultures and how they relate to manage and schedule events. And then micro, my monochronic, monochronic, chromatic, monochromatic cultures uh, prefer to organize and schedule things sequentially, where polychromatic, chromatic cultures use um, simultaneous occurrences of many different activities. So culture versus dialect, dialectic. All cultures contain dimensions of tensions called dialectics, uh, dialectics, dialectics. Too many cooks for the broth. Two heads are better than one are conflicting adages, attention or dial, dialectic. Um, the advantage is that it can explain variations within cultures. Uh, a similar method of studies, negotiations, metaphors for effects of culture on negotiations, as well as the greater 
the difference in cultural negotiation metaphors, the harder it would be for negotiators to find common ground. So the culture as a dialectic approach starts with a deep understanding of culture and uses negotiation metaphors for richer understanding. Now, culture and context, let's look at that for a moment. This recognizes that behavior as a complex, as complex as negotiators is determined by many factors, one of which is culture as personality, context, and environmental factors. Using culture as the sole explanation oversimplifies the complexity. Uh, researchers' cultural complexity theory suggests that cultural values directly affect negotiations in some situations. So there's direct effects. Um, direct effects have strong effects across several contexts, such as American individuality. So cultural values have moderate effects in other situations. Here, values have different contextual um, instigators in the culture, such as France with both mon mon monarchical and democratic uh, tra traditions uh, that are going on, uh, the monarch as well as democratic. The influence of cultural negotiation starts with the, um, let's define the definition of negotiation varies across cultures. American views it as competitive, Japanese as information sharing. Culture influences perception of distributive or integrative. North American negotiators view it as distributive, not elsewhere. That's only in North America. Negotiator selection criteria is weighted differently. Make, may include knowledge, sen seniority, connections, gender, age, or status. So you gotta know what you're dealing with. Even this negotiation process, if you look at companies, a lot of these things are factors in our own culture or the American culture. You gotta look at the company because everyone is different. It depends on the culture of the organization that is the, or the individuals and the culture they built for that organization. So American culture is very informal, not so in other countries. Uh, cultural influences communications, uh, as well as verbal and nonverbal. At the planning stage, seek at the end of the planning stage, we have to seek advice on proper communication protocol. So there are cultural influences as well. So cultures uh, determine what time means. In the US, for example, people tend to respect time, not so in other countries. Risk-oriented cultures move early, others wait and see. Americans fall on the risk-taking end of the continuum. The US is an individual-oriented culture. The group-oriented cultures see individual needs as second to the group. We are about individuals here. Culture affects agreements and the form they take. So U.S. agreements are based on logic, formalized and enforced, whereas culture influences the extent negotiators display emotions. They may even be tactics or genuine responses. Influence of culture and research perspective. There are two approaches where, uh, where taken to explore if culture influences negotiation outcomes. Uh, intracultural, do negotiators reach the same outcomes when presented with the same material across cultures? That's one. Or cross-cultural, compares intracultural intra -cultural and cross-cultural outcomes to see if they are the same. Um, initial intercultural studies found no link between profit and culture, but later simulations identified cultural differences. Cross-cultural negotiations, well, that resulted in poor outcomes compared to intracultural at least some of the time. So continue on the cultural effects on the process um, as well as uh, information exchange, we see that individualism and collectivism influence planning um, and offers, yes. Some cultures use direct information exchange while others use indirect information exchange. So 
Uh, US is a direct information exchange, whereas Japan, for example, is a more of an indirect information exchange. So culturally similar countries negotiated higher joint gains. Japanese negotiators shared more information when negotiating with Americans than they did domestically. And low context cultures use direct communication and those with high context cultures use more indirect communications. Now, culture and channel, and channel influence the general communication strategy. Some cultures negotiate consistently, both internally and internationally, like China and others do. Okay. So effects of negotiators, or, or effects of culture on negotiators' ethics. Uh, there's a broad study investigating perceptions of negotiation tactics across six cultures, and they found these differences. The tolerance levels of different tactics in different cultures, the likely use of specific tactics, such as aggregated opening offers, trust levels change to use or absence or questionable tactics, the way negotiators deal within and out group negotiations. There is also evidence the use and interpretation of apologies is really influenced by culture. And then there's individualistic societies use apologies to assign blame and co collective cultures use apologies to express remorse. So there's effects of culture on conflict resolutions. And negotiators from collectivist cultures use accommodation, collaboration, and withdrawal from conflict. Compare it with negotiators from individualistic cultures who had a stronger preference for competition. Collectivist countries solve disagreements with rules where individualistic countries use personal experience and training. Outgroup disagreements were less likely in high power distance cultures than in low power distance cultures. And then individualistic and collectivist cultures prefer negotiation to arbitration. Mediation is a little bit had a harder effect on outcomes with individuals. So culturally responsive negotiation strategies include negotiators should not make large modifications to their approach. And we say this because they may not be able to modify their approach effectively. Even if modified effectively, it may not lead to a better outcome. Also negotiators negotiate differently with their own cultures than with others. And then there's moderate adaptation may also be a most, may be the most effective in that negotiation process. Adjustments may be unlikely for a more distant culture. So during, uh, during preparation, a negotiator should concentrate on A, their own biases, strengths, and weaknesses. And we've talked about that before. Uh, the other negotiator as an individual and the other negotiator, negotiator's cultural context. So those are three things that if you're preparing, especially for an international negotiation, the things that one should consider and the negotiator should consider. So why is uh, culturally responsive strategy includes low familiarity, moderate familiarity, and high familiarity. Under low use agents, unilateral strategy, use a mediator's joint strategy, and introduce the other to use your approach, the joint strategy. Whereas um, under moderate familiarity, if you're familiar, adapt to the other's approach, unilateral strategy, coordinate adjustment, joint strategy. High familiarity means you start with embracing the other's approach, unilateral strategy, and then you improper an approach, joint strategy. Affect symphony, joint strategy. And that does it for chapter 16 on strategy. Again, I think if you have the time, I know it's a lot, but Hofstadt's um, strategy, if, if you can if you have time to look that up, I think that you will get a lot from that. Um, it is great. This is just cover the basics, but you will see which countries fall up under which areas. 
And it's also something good to have in your back pocket, especially if you're involved in international negotiations for your company. And so that's it for this week. We did chapter 13 and chapter 16 for this week. And I hope you got a lot from it. And I look forward to seeing uh, your response to our discussions this week. Take care.